So thank you everyone for joining us um, today and still in these virtual times, um, but makes this topic especially especially important and a bit timely here. So we have Charlie Kreitzberg with us today, who's the Senior User Experience Advisor um, with us at Princeton at the Office um, of Information Technology. So um, he's gonna be talking a bit about writing for the web. Um, and if I can just click this next slide quickly, uh, just a couple housekeeping tips, just so everyone knows that the session is being recorded. Um, and we do ask that you have your microphone muted when you're not speaking or asking um, questions. We do have the chat available for questions at any time as well. Um, and it looks like some of you have already done this, but we do encourage you to turn your camera on um, since this is meant to be more interactive and kind of simulate that we're all in the same room together. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Charlie. Well, thank you all so much for coming. It's it's I, great to see most of you, I guess. <laughs> um, screen is getting a little bit tight, but uh, welcome. This is the second in a series of user experience uh, webinars that we've been conducting. And uh, today's topic is writing for the web. So let me just start off with a few thanks there is an african proverb that says it takes a village to raise a child and equally it, it takes a village to put on one of these webinars and i want to thank thank some of the folks at uh, the keller center who have been so incredibly helpful carrie collins and greg duncan both of whom are behind the scenes here making sure that everything uh, is working gina sesta who you've just met and is also one of our co-hosts, and Susan Sparrigan, who is my colleague at the User Experience Office. So thanks to everyone. It gives me a great sense of security to know that you're all here. So let's talk about expectations. You know, this is not the ideal way that I would like to be running this uh, session. I'd like to be sitting in a room with you for more time. I'd like to be able to be have you do some writing, we could discuss it and critique it. And that's going to be tough in this environment. We'll do as much interactivity as we can. Uh, but um, basically, you know, what I will try to do is lay out for you a structure for how we can approach write, writing for the web and uh, give you a bunch of techniques. I'm going to try to walk a line between not being too theoretical, but giving you some structure that you can rely on and giving you uh, practical techniques that you can use. And I imagine that we could, uh, this will be recorded, but we can also probably get the PowerPoint to you or a, a handout to you afterwards, because I don't want you to go crazy taking notes while we're talking. So we'll find a way to get that to you. So basically, let me start off by sharing with you uh, the steps, the, the, the overview uh, of what we're going to do. So I'm going to give you a process that I came up with that divides the, um, that builds the process of, of, of creating um, a, a web content. And I'm, we're calling it writing and I'm gonna use the word reader, but it's not always all about text. We also will deal with, there is audio, there's video, there's animations, there are all sorts of things you can do on the web. Uh, and the three steps, uh, we'll talk about the overview and then the three major steps, which are understanding the mindset of your readers, deciding what you want to say, which sounds really interesting, but guess what? It's not all that simple. Um, and then producing your material and three aspects of that, clarity, by which I mean visual clarity and layout, comprehension, which is mental clarity and how people are going to understand things, and connection, which is the emotional relationship that you have with your readers. So if you have questions, normally I like to keep uh, these uh, the, the mics open, but we have quite a few people signed up today. So I think the easiest thing is if you have a question or you wanna add a comment or you have an insight you wanna share, if you raise your hand, uh, we will, um, uh, open your mic so that you can talk and let's try to make it as interactive as we possibly can. 
Um, okay, so let me show you the basic uh, process that I came up with here. And there are three steps and they really need to be done in this order. So the first thing is understand your readers. The second thing is decide what you want to say. And the third thing is produce your material for clarity, for comprehension, for connection, and then finally test it to make sure that it works the way you want. And if you are familiar with design thinking, you'll realize this really is very similar to traditional design thinking. Uh, we start off by understanding the problem, uh, creating empathy, and then we are going to do design, which is uh, and, and basically production and then testing. And it is basically the same process that you should be familiar with uh, if you've studied design thinking at all. So let's start off by talking about understanding your readers. Um, so this picture, this is a square peg and a round hole. And basically I have seen so many websites where there is a real mismatch between the people who are consuming the information and the people who are producing the information. And there are many reasons why that happens and we'll talk about a bunch of those. But I think that's what's really is important uh, is that you have to have a round peg for a round hole, right? Uh, if, if one of the things I think that you have to remember is that uh, reading is an information transmission. You have a receiver, which is the reader, and you have a transmitter, which is, is the uh, person, us presenting the message. If you are familiar uh, with information theory, it's a very common diagram. I guess I wish I'd put a slide in showing that, which shows how the message goes from the transmitter to uh, the receiver. The thing is, if they're not in sync, it's not going to work. If you're broadcasting an FM signal and you have an AM radio, it's just not going to work. So here are four questions that I think you ought to be asking yourself uh, in order to understand the mindset of the reader. So the first one is, what's their goal in coming here? Why are they coming to this site? Nobody comes to a website without a goal in mind, whether their purpose is entertainment or education or they want to learn how to apply to Princeton University or whatever it is they have some kind of goal. You need to understand what that goal is. Secondly, you have to ask that, you have to ask yourself, what information do they want? What are they trying to get? One of the problems we tend to have, and I'll mention this uh, again later, is that we fall in love with our information. We love the stuff that we want to talk about. And so we want to give people lots of stuff that they may not be interested in at this particular time. And that's one of the most difficult things for writers is to not be in love with your information and take a step back and say, no, let me really focus on the information that meets the goals of the users. And then thirdly, how are they going to use that information? What are they going to do when they walk away from the site? That helps you think about how you're going to present it, how you're going to allow them to record it the same way I was saying to you. I'm concerned about how you're going to make use of this information when the webinar is over. And so I want to think about how I can get this information to you in a form that you can use. And finally, what sort of words or concepts are likely to be difficult for them? What aren't they going to understand? In the Information Technology Office uh, last year, we uh, accumulated all of the acronyms that we used, and it turned out we had 273 acronyms that people just don't necessarily understand. And when you're in an educational environment like Princeton, we're dealing with very complex subject matter, which people may or may not comprehend. So we need to understand what that is and deal with it in the writing. So any questions so far uh, about what I'm, I'm uh, presenting here? Pause for a moment. And I am not seeing chat, so I'm assuming there is no chat, and that if somebody types something into chat, it will pop up. Yeah, there's nothing typed in chat right now. 
okay. So I will mention that I am not seeing the chat for whatever reason here. Um, so let me just mention while we're, we're dealing with this, this is um, from Steve Krog's book, Don't Make Me Think. And he's a funny guy. Uh, he's a UX person. Um, and he made this comment in his book, Don't, Don't Make Me Think. He says, we're thinking great literature or at least product brochure but the user's reality is much more closer to a billboard going by at 60 miles an hour. And that's what we have to realize about information we're delivering on the web. People do not process it. They do not curl up the way uh, you might curl up with a book for pleasure. And they don't necessarily read deeply. Sometimes they do. But more typically, it's more like paging through a magazine. They scan, they look at things that might be interesting, they jump from thing to thing. And so we need to design so that the scanning uh, works. Okay, so that was all I wanted to say about understanding the readers. And that doesn't mean that that's all there is to say about it. It's just, um, it's just a topic that we could spend a lot of time on and very core to user experience. But let's move on to the second step, which is deciding what you want to say. Okay. So here are the questions that I think you and the, the team you're working with should uh, ask, which is, what are the points you want to make? Again, you don't want to, you can't tell people everything. You're not writing War and Peace, you're writing a website. And so it's really important to get very clear about what pieces of information are important. And you have to distinguish between information that's essential and information that's secondary. I, I recently had a situation with a, uh, a researcher who, who has done some amazing work in autism and has built a site to teach parents uh, how to uh, educate their autistic children at home. But she puts so, so much information into it um, that people can't read it and they can't process it and it's off-putting to them. And she cannot bring herself to remove that information because the inf because she's worked so hard on it and every piece of information and every nuance is so incredibly important to her. So this is a difficult thing for many people to do. I've seen this happen a lot at the university. Um, so we have to break that down. If you, you should really try to write your initial site in bullet points or at least build your, your notion in bullet points. If you want to expand after that a bit, that's fine, but get it right down to the key points you want to make. The third issue is around organizing the material so it fits your reader. And that goes back to the square peg and the round hole, right? We'll talk more about what this means, but people have a cognitive structure. They have a way of understanding the world. If the material that you produce fits the way they understand it, it goes right into their heads and they understand it. Otherwise, they have a lot of work to do, and they they don't uh, they don't learn nearly as much, and they can't process nearly as much information. There's a lot of talk about information overload, and one of the things we've learned in research is that we can process a vast amount of information when it's structured appropriately, so that it's continually meaningful. But if it's not, then we have trouble processing it. So that leads you to the fourth point, which is what's the best way you can think of to present the information? So again, let me pause and ask if people have any comments, questions, or insights you'd like to share. I just have a quick question um, and you may um, cover later. And yeah. so uh, even for just um, academic writing or any other writings, 
we are asked to consider our readers' uh, needs. And when we make a presentation, we also need to think about what the main points you want to uh, present and what, what is the uh, you know, essential information, what is the secondary. I'm just wondering what is the most significant difference between writing on website and writing on you know, traditional media? Yeah, that's a really good question. So academic writing um, in, in uh, journals tends to be very dense, uses many, many hard words. Um, it's very detailed. It's sort of in some ways the total opposite of what we want to produce. And I actually have an example of that that I'll bring up uh, a little bit later. Uh, honestly, I think I understand about three words in that entire um, presentation. I think it's a, uh, the, and of. And, um, you know, in a, in a way, I mean, I'm a psychologist by training. And to me, it might be the difference between reading a, 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 an article in a, in a psychology journal and reading psychology today. And... Um, when you look at the kind of writing, it's more in, in, in psychology today, it's more informal, it's more conversational. Later, we'll talk about tone and some of the dimensions of tone of voice and the way that those, those shift. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think there is a, a very big difference between academic writing. We're also going to take a look uh, if the... Um, if the uh, web, web gods are good to us at, at a piece of the Princeton website. And, and I'll show you how they've taken a research thing and turned it into something much more popular. Any other, any other questions about this before we move on? Or thoughts? Okay. So, Let's talk about some of the risks. What, what, is, what is likely to get your web writing or your website onto the wrong track? These are things I have seen over and over and over again here at the university and in my life before it, but very much so here. So the first one is adopting an organizational perspective instead of a user perspective. So typically what happens at the university is uh, there is some group, some department uh, that says, we're going to produce a website. And then they sit down and they say, let's tell you everything about us. We are this and we're this and we do this and we do that. It's all about them. That doesn't work because that's not what the reader is looking for. And that's why step one says understand your reader, understand what their mental model is, what their goals are, what their, their sphere of understanding is, what their priorities are, and build your writing to that, not to explaining everything about your organization. Now, you may need for reasons of, of completeness or for compliance or legality, you may need to put some of those things in there. So they, it doesn't mean necessarily don't put them into your site, but don't feature them and force the people to slog through a lot of text and a lot of material uh, for that. The second things are a stakeholder. These are like deadly. I believe we have to do this and we're gonna do this and they insist it has to be a certain way. Uh, it's got to be said this way, it's got to be this color, it's got to be this icon, it's got to be this shape. And that is a very difficult thing, particularly when the stakeholder is either very persistent or is an authority. Uh, but it can be devastating to the site because it pushes you in the wrong direction. Um, the third, which I've mentioned before, is falling in love with your information. Um, I know we all love what we do. We love our products. We love our research. If we're running a company, we love everything about it. I mean, I, I ran a company for 30 years and I loved it, but that's not what they want to hear. And finally, testing. It's really, really important to test your material to see if it works. Uh, Jacob Nielsen, who is uh, 
writes very, very excellent free articles on the web uh, and is worth checking, says he believes that when you're, when you're testing your material, you should remove it from the uh, website and just test it against a plain white background. And that keeps people from uh, perhaps looking at the colors or getting involved in the fonts. And I do know where he's coming from. On the other hand, you may decide that it's important to show people the actual site you're working on to see what they can learn from it. So I didn't have, I don't have a lot here on testing, but it is something you should be thinking about, which is showing it to people and then asking them what they learn. And also asking them if they can find things uh, on your site and seeing what their process is. Because if they can't find it, they can't learn it and they can't process it. Okay, any questions about these? Okay, so we've blazed through steps one and two. So now let's focus on what I really wanted to put most of my focus on today, which is how you go about producing your material and what the techniques are. Before you do this, make sure you've done those steps one and two. You've talked about your readers, you've thought about them, you have some sense of who they are, you've really gotten very clear about what you want to say, and now you're ready to do writing. And I came up with this uh, notion that I call the three C's. The three C's are clarity, comprehension, and connection. You won't see it anywhere else because I made it up, but it, it does give you a way of, um, you know, making sure that you've hit all the high points here. So let's look at these, these points. So let's start out with clarity. I, this is uh, one of my favorite uh, quotes. Uh, it's from John Nesbitt, which goes all the way back to 1982. And he says, we're drowning information, but starved for knowledge. And that is a complaint that we hear all the time. So here's the design challenge that you have when you're producing your information. Can you organize and present the information so the user obtains the most meaning with the least effort? Now, let me just take a minute to talk about the parts of here that I've bolded. So when I talk about organizing information, I'm talking about two aspects of organizing. One of them is the layout, the physical, the fonts, the white space, the headings, uh, and the vision, in other words, the visual organization of information, which is tremendously important. Uh, but there's also an issue of cognitive organization. Are you organizing the material in a way and presenting it in a way that can be understood? And the issue here, going down to the last line, are around meaning and effort. So we really need to understand that the goal of what we're doing is to transmit meaning. We're not transmitting information, but we're transmitting meaning. Meaning doesn't happen until the person has internalized the information and goes, yeah, I get it, I understand it. And we want to do this in a way that has the least effort for our reader, for our user. Because the more effort that they have to put into understanding something, the less they're going to understand. Think about it in your own mind. You have a really, really difficult thing to read. You work really hard at it. Um, then you have, you don't process it nearly as well. Okay, so now let's look at the three steps here. So clarity, again, um, is what I'm talking about here is visual clarity. Um, presentation. Comprehension is writing so your reader can understand it, and connection is engaging your readers emotionally by using the right tone and creating an atmosphere of trust. 
we'll move on to the first area, which is how do you achieve clarity? So clarity is visual design. And that leads us to the first thing. If they can't find it, or they can't read it, they can't understand it. You've got a very limited set of things to work with, which in some respects makes it easier. You've got rich text, which means you can pick fonts, you can pick weights, you can pick colors. You've got images, you've got animation, which can be useful, but you've got to be very careful about how you're using it. You've got audio, you've got video, and then you've got, and I put it on the other side deliberately, hyperlinks and hotspots in graphics. And the reason that these are so powerful is they mean that you don't have to take all the information and put it out into a flood, but you can actually create an information hierarchy where Essentially, what you do is you say, I'll take some information and I'll defer it to secondary or tertiary information <coughs> and enable the reader to get to it through a hyperlink or to a hotspot. Is that clear for everyone? So let me share uh, five techniques that I think are really important. So the first one is fonts avoiding overly decorative fonts. Font size, this is really something I take very personally because as I've reached a certain age, my vision has gone down and there are many sites that I can no longer read because they're produced by 21 year old, you know, programmers who have no idea that at some point they're not gonna be able to read these really small fonts. And the same is true for contrast. I have great respect of the design, uh, the design work that Apple Computer does, but I really wish they would drop their gray on white. And in fact, let me show you what happens here. Um, I've now switched that first font to a decorative font. Look how difficult it is to read. And imagine a page built with all of that. The second font, the second uh, line, I put in the font size at six points. And it's really takes a lot of uh, visual acuity to be able to read that. And in the third, I've used light gray on white. Now there is a rule for contrast, which is the contrast between text and your background should be 4.5 or better. And in fact, if you can make it seven, that's even better. You might say, how do I know? And the answer is that there are many tools on the web that will show you the contrast. Um, so that if you have some text and you have a background, you can put those colors into the tools. It'll come back and tell you you're a four or you're a two or you're a seven. And, and you'll know the, the standard uh, WCAG, which is the, uh, uh, Web Content Accessibility Group, I think I got that acronym right. Uh, they have several levels of compliance and 4.5 is the um, minimum, although in their AAA compliance, they recommend seven. And that does make it a lot easier. Uh, I should tell you that the size of the text makes a difference. So the larger the text, the lower the contrast you can get away with. With small text, you really have to make the contrast very high. With, with um, large text, it's not so, so bad. Using headings to show importance is really, um, really um, very important. Uh, and having white space to break things up is really important. I'll show you some examples of that. So, so let's turn to headings and to white space. So here is um, a, a, something I pulled out of Wikipedia's article on Princeton University, and it's about Princeton residential colleges. And uh, if I asked you who originally proposed the residential colleges, you might take a minute to see if you can find that. 
And it's not so hard because it's only a paragraph. But if you look at this, you'll see was originally proposed by University President Woodrow Wilson in the early, early 20th century. But it's really not very easy. And when you have large amounts of text, and because I'm using PowerPoint, I couldn't really give you anything the size I wanted to here. It's really, really hard. Um, it's really, really hard to, to find the information. Now I'm going to take the same text, and all I've done is paragraph it by using white space. And look how much easier it is to, to read. Because now, and, and, and I've been very careful as I did this, not to put the white space in arbitrarily, but to put the white space in where it makes semantic sense. So if you look over here, the first paragraph talks about what is a residential college. The second paragraph talks about what, are, what elements are in a residential college. And then the third talks about the history of residential colleges. So there's a logic behind the white space. And now if I add headings to that, it gets much, much easier because now I've got a heading. And if I said to you, could you tell me about the history, your eye will immediately jump down here to the history of the residential colleges and you'll begin reading that piece of text. So the headings makes it easy to scan. So you always, always should use headings and white space in your writing. You should be very aware of the fact that 20% of the population has a disability. And it is essential uh, to have headings, particularly for people, uh, although not exclusively for people who have low vision and use screen readers. Because with screen readers, they jump from heading to heading so that people can find what's there. If you don't have good heading structure, uh, it, is, it is a problem. The screen readers don't work. So with all of that together, I'd like to show you a well-designed web page. And we can't open it. Charlie, if I could just interrupt for just oh, you a know second. Why, you know why we couldn't open it? It's because I'm only sharing, I think. This. What can just you do, Gina? Um, I'm sorry, I just wanted to interrupt. There was a question that was posed um, oh, okay. in the chat, if I could read it off to you. Um, regarding color contrast, what do you think of the Princeton standard orange color for links? Um, this person manages a Princeton department website and should, they are stuck with the built-in style, including the bright orange hyperlinks. So that's a, <laughs> I love that question. So when uh, we were building the Princeton EDU site, that question came up and we looked at the, the orange links and they did not meet the standard. Um, the orange, as I believe that is in the templates, has been tweaked. It's not actually Princeton orange. It's been made slightly darker, so it just squeaks through um, and, and makes it work. I have noticed, um, I have noticed that um, with, with um, recently, they don't seem to be using the orange on the Princeton EDU site anymore. They're using underlining and a gray type, a dark gray for the links. So uh, that's certainly an issue you may want to take up with web development services if you're using the uh, if you're using the orange, but it does work okay, but just barely. Let me see if I can change my share here. I think I should be able to do this. Let's see. Is my desktop available? I don't see it. All right, is there, what I'd like to do is bring up the Princeton website. Let me see if I can do that. Apologize for this, but let's see what I can do. Oops, somebody just sent me a chat and I didn't. I accidentally dismissed it. I am totally stuck here. Is there any way we can get to the site uh, easily or? Yeah, like you just can. Could you bring it up on your your uh, machine? And yeah. Are you looking for just the home page? Yeah, we. I, I was going. I have a particular article, but I think it's still there. Okay, give me one second here. 
I just wanted you to take a look at this. I think the communications, the Office of Communications does a fabulous job on, on the way they design stuff. So I just want to sort of point it out to you. Great. So if you could scroll down. And the article I was hoping, yeah, let's see, keep going. Uh, might be gone. I was looking for the um, physicists who were working on the um, the um, ventilators, which is a great article. It's a good place for it. Do any of these look like the... Uh... All right, rather than making everybody go nuts, uh, what we could certainly do is just pick any one of these. I think uh, it's not, not, not critical. Does this first one work? I'm sorry? Does this first one work here, the we roar? Yeah, sure, let's take a look at that. Ah, oh, somebody just put it in chat. So Gina, if you look in the chat, Stephen Alexander just gave us the link. Okay, bear with me, my computer's just a little slow. Here we go. At least I will have read that article. <laughs> okay, so let's just look at this. We'll sort of scroll through it slowly. So at the top, we have a hero image. Now I want to now take a look at the way they've used headings. Okay, so if you go just down a little bit more, so we have a, a major heading here at the top: particle physicist design simplified ventilator for COVID-19 patients. That heading immediately shows you what this article is about. Then they have a secondary heading below the orange line, which is a summary of the entire article. If you just read that, you know whether you want to read the whole article. It helps you in scanning and making it, you know, making it clear what's going to happen. And then look to the right, and you see here a summary of the entire article. Uh, it's similar to the subhead, but here they say an international team of particle physicists led by Princeton Christian uh, Gal, Galbiati, a little hard to read. See I, what I told you about gray on white, uh, paused their search for dark matter to focus on the growing demand for ventilators needed for patients with serious cases of COVID-19, COVID coronavirus. Notice there they uh, explained a technical term. Remember I said earlier, you have to be careful to do that. Their mechanical venter, ventilator Milano MVM seen here is designed to be mass produced using readily available components. Okay. That is the entire guts of the article right there. Now I might question whether they put it in the right place, but very powerfully done. Now let's look at the first couple of paragraphs here, first two or three. So the first paragraph, in severe cases, COVID-19 can lead to pneumonia requiring mechanical ventilation, but the world supply of ventilators has proven too small for the exponentially increasing demand. Now I used to write a column for a, um, a trade magazine and my editor, uh, one thing she really beat into me was that the first sentence of your uh, article should summarize what the article is, should explain exactly what it is. Don't lead the reader into it slowly. Don't create. We're going to build a story and then we're going to get to the punchline. Put that punchline right up front. And you can see that in writing this article, that's exactly what Liz has done. Then the second paragraph, that's called the lead. 
Okay, then the second paragraph expands on it and explains what the article is. So we put the problem now, the public health care system in Lombardy is, and the professor speaks. Then the third paragraph says exactly what they've done. And after that, the article now goes off into detail. Beautifully, beautifully written, uh, perfectly structured so that, you know, you could stop at the headline, you could just read the abstract, you could stop at any point here. If you get through the third paragraph, you really know everything you need to know. And now if you're interested, you can go further. So any questions or comments about this? And Stephen, thank you for giving us the link. Okay, no questions. So let's, let's see if we can get back to the PowerPoint. Okay, the next thing, and this is actually where my heart is, this is about achieving comprehension. I'm a psychologist, I'm an instructional or educational psychologist by training. So I am really, I guess, most interested in how people structure their thinking and how we can improve uh, the efficiency of conveying information to people. So there are really two conditions that are essential and one thing that's useful. And if you can remember these conditions, you'll be able to structure information so that people can comprehend it easily and quickly. The first thing is that the user must, must have the appropriate prior knowledge. Now, when you take a class at the university, we require prerequisites. You can take organic chemistry before you've taken inorganic chemistry. And the reason, I am assuming, since I never took organic chemistry, um, is that if you don't understand the basics of inorganic chemistry, you won't be able to understand the organic chemistry. So when we lay out the courses, we're very careful about thinking, what do you have to learn first uh, before you learn the next thing? The same thing is absolutely true for you when you're building a website. What do the people need to know to be able to understand what I'm writing? The second thing is not only must they possess the prior knowledge, but they have to connect the new information with the knowledge that they have. So what can happen, and I'm gonna show you uh, examples of this so you'll see how this works, that even though you know something, you may not be able to uh, process it because you didn't recognize that you knew it. And then the third thing, which is not a uh, condition for comprehension, but makes comprehension much, much easier, is you have to organize the material so that it fits the cognitive structure of the reader. And that's also sometimes called the reader's schema or the schemata of the reader which is the way they organize information. Okay. Any questions about this? I'm gonna go into more depth on all of these. So I'm gonna, let's talk about understanding prior knowledge. So I'm going to show you some text and the probability is there might be somebody in this audience who does understand it. I'd be fascinated to know it because I've used this about three or four times uh, and nobody has ever been able to explain this text to me at all. Take a moment to read that. Okay, now. This is a piece of text that came, it's, it's an abstract from a journal article. I'm sure it's very meaningful to certain people, but I will tell you it is completely non-meaningful to me. I don't even know what it's about. And that's because I don't have the uh, prior knowledge to be able to interpret words like endosomal and lysosomal adapter and so on and so forth. I just don't know what they are. 
Okay. The second thing is that you have to connect the new information with the information that you already have. Okay. So I'm going to show you some examples of how that can go awry. Let's look at a situation where you possess the prior knowledge, but perhaps you don't recognize it. So read this section. I'll give you a minute to read it and just see how well you understand it. Perhaps when you're done, raise your hand so we know to move on. Great. Okay. So I'm not sure I'll be able to see this, but uh, one of the co-hosts can help me with this. I, I, by, you know, on a scale of one to 10, one was like, this was totally simple to 10, like this is incredible. Tell me in your chat, how hard would you say this was? We've got a couple nines, eight, five, eight, nine point five, seven, three eights. Seven, nine, seven, right. five. So nobody, at least so far, has said it's easier than so-so. And pretty much all of you are down at this end of the, of the uh, scale saying it's hard. And yet the words are easy. And let me make it clear to you, the passage is actually extremely simple. And the only problem was it was designed by a researcher uh, so that you wouldn't realize that you understood, you didn't relate it to the existing information. So what I'm gonna do now is show it to you. And all I'm going to do is I'll let you read it again. And this time I'm going to put a headline on the, on the paragraph and read it again and notice how much easier and less effort it is and how every single sentence in there makes sense. Somebody tell me what what is what is different about it once you see this is about doing laundry. How is your cognitive processing different from the original? What's different in your head? Uh, Charlie, we have a comment that came in that said context is context is everything. Um, I know what I'm picturing now. Another person said, you're not guessing what this content is about. Uh, context is everything is one of my favorite phrases. Uh, so I'm so glad to hear it. That's exactly right. Doing laundry creates context. Now, if you had never done laundry in your life, you would have fallen into the problem with problem one, which is you didn't have the prior knowledge. But sadly, every one of us does laundry all the time that's what very rich. And um, so when once I tell you I have activated the context by giving you the headline, and now every sentence, first you arrange things into, I, I don't, I, some of this is blocked on my screen, into different groups. Well, of course, we put the white stuff and the colored, the delicates together. And in your mind, you can play that out. So you are able to cognitively, you're able to elaborate the information. And that's how we know that it's being understood meaningfully. Okay, I should say, one of, one of the questions when you're going to do testing, you wanna know, did somebody process something meaningfully? Can you guess what, it's a really simple way to find out if somebody's understood something meaningfully? Ask them. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear it. Uh, we have a comment that says, ask them. Ask them, but ask them what? Did you understand it meaningfully? 
and they're going to say, you know, how, what, what do you need to ask them to know that they have understood it? Um, ask them, what, what's it about? Yes. They ask them to say it in their own words. Wow. If you can say it in your own words, then you've understood it meaningfully. If you can't say it in your own words, then you haven't understood it meaningfully. All you've done is memorized it. That's one of the reasons that essay exams, for example, are so good. If you're really trying to find out if somebody understands something, I would always pick an essay exam or an interview over anything else. So that's a good thing to remember. The third thing is that the most mean, efficient and meaningful learning takes place when the organization of the material fits the person's existing cognitive structure. If it's presented the way you understand it, then they will, uh, they will understand it. And that brings us to the very famous inverted pyramid, which you saw in the Princeton.edu article, right? So basically, you start with the lead deliver the most critical information up front, which they're always telling you who, what, when, where, right? And then give them the secondary information, facts and details that are important, uh, that are useful in understanding the story, but you wouldn't lose it. And then finally give them the details. So I mentioned I ran a company for about 25 years and, um, Frequently, my staff would come to me uh, to tell me what they were doing. And it usually started out with, let me tell you about what's going on, Charlie. They tell me the story. And then they'd say, let me tell you how I, what, how I understand it and what I think the problem is. And then finally, they would say to me, so here's what I'm planning to do. Is that OK? And what I kept trying to train them to do, I said, flip it around. Give it to me in the inverted pyramid. Walk into my office and say, Charlie, this is what I'm going to do. If I'm not clear why you're going to do it, then I would say, okay, explain to me how you've analyzed the problem. If I listened to their analysis and I didn't fully understand how they got to the conclusion they got to, I said, all right, explain the situation to me so I can do my own analysis. So that inverted pyramid is, is very, very efficient and very powerful. It is not the only way. We don't have time to begin to go into all the elements of cognitive structure, but the more you understand about your user's mental models, the better you'll be able to uh, organize the material so that it fits them. Uh, here are some of the um, organizational schemes that you can use in order to uh, organize your material. So the first one is you can organize by time. This happened, then that happened, then something else happened. Or you can actually build a timeline, which can be visually very effective. Uh, you show the dates, you show the points, and then you can have hyperlinks and click on them and then give people the details. Um, years ago, I had a wonderful book called, I think it was The Timeline of Human History. And the whole book was just a timeline from the time that we became a species up to the present time. And it gave you a real sense of how things, things operated. Or you can organize by sequence. First, this step happened, then that step happened. That's how you organize a recipe, right? You say, first, light the stove, then put on the frying pan, then put the oil into it, then put the stuff in and brown it. So you give it to them that way. Compare and contrast. Um, so you say, explain one versus the other. Cause and effect, which is, you know, this happened, therefore that happened. Uh, problem and solution, which was the one we saw on the Princeton site. Okay, there are not enough um, there are not enough ventilators. The solution was 
these physicists who are familiar with working with gases and dark matter and uh, equipment to make it work are developing a solution for it. You can also do spatial, um, and that can be extremely powerful. So for example, if you're dealing with something, let's say political in the United States, you might in your mind go through it by state by state or region by region. Um, or if you're dealing with a cell, you could talk about you know, the membrane and the nucleus and, and different, the mitochondria and pick those elements. Um, one rule which I put in the box here on the side is when you're writing a paragraph, it's wise to put the most important information into the first sentence and put it into the beginning of the first sentence. Now, we don't always like to do that for stylistic reasons, but again, on the web, because people are scanning, this lets them jump from paragraph to paragraph and see if they want to read. When we do eye tracking studies on people reading from the web, what we see is they actually, they jump, 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 they see something that looks interesting, and then they go in and they read. And then they jump, 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 and they find something and they read. So they do it in those, those kind of clumps. And so what we wanna do is make it as simple as possible for people to decide whether a particular clump of information is useful to them. Any questions about this or comments or insights? Okay, so here are some of the implications for writing. First of all, make sure the reader has the needed prerequisite knowledge. And be really, really, really careful with acronyms, with jargon, and with technical terms. And if they don't, if you suspect they don't, then supply it. Now, the problem with supplying it is if you give them too much prerequisite information, you're likely to clutter up your, um, your text. And, and again, we wanna keep it spartan and simple. So that's why the hyperlink or the hotspot can be so valuable. Um, I've seen on uh, mobile, um, on my phone here, there's a, a, um, a site I often go to called Diet Doc. I think it's Diet Doctor. Uh, you can tell where my head is at. And um, he puts, these are a bunch of um, physicians who write about diet and, and, and health, and they do a lot of referencing. And what they do is they use a little dot. And if you hover on, touch that dot, it pops up with the um, with the information and that kind of thing can be very useful. If you're working on a desktop machine, you have the ability to do hovering, although you have to be careful uh, for people who cannot use a mouse or cannot see. So that can be problematic. Um, but basically you can use the links to provide the preliminary information. Okay. Um, the second thing here, third thing, I guess, is to make sure you've given the reader the cues they need to relate the new material to the context. Um, the, um, that was the problem you had with the doing laundry. You understood it, but I didn't give you the cue uh, to release it. Sometimes the other thing that happens is people get the wrong context. Uh, somebody has a comment? Yes, there's a question. Um, what is your perspective on considering what writing for search engine optimization might require if and when this might compete with the needs of the user slash reader? Yeah, so that is uh, always a problem. Um, and I am not an expert in SEO, so I'm probably not the right person to answer that question. But the short answer is the way at least I tend to handle it is I put a lot of that stuff into the, um, the page names, the page descriptions, and then I will add sections to the text maybe in the footer that puts a lot of useful information and I try not to clutter up the text that I'm delivering to the user. I, I'm sure there are people who, who have much better ways of handling it, um, but that is certainly how I do it. Uh, I was mentioning about uh, getting the wrong context. I'll give you a, an example. When people uh, 
don't have context, they tend to jump on the statistically most predominant uh, meaning for something. So I'll give you an example. I will tell you this phrase and tell me and think what comes into your mind. The pen is in the box. Now I would pretty much guess that almost everybody here got a vision of a ballpoint pen in some kind of box. But then I could tell you this story. The pen is in the box. I have a young grandson, he's six years old. His name is Henry and for his birthday, I bought him a plastic farm. He loves farm animals. And he was so excited. He said, oh, well, there's a horse and there's a cow. He said, oh my gosh, what, what's gonna happen if the horses run away? And I said, you don't have to worry about that because you'll put them in the pen. See, the pen is in the box. Now, here the meaning of pen was completely different. And yet when I said it at first, you had the wrong meaning for pen. And so if, you, if somebody comes up with the wrong context, you have to rewind the, the mental tape and reinterpret the information. And it depends how long it was between you made the error in context and you, the time you figured it out as to how much work it's gonna be or if you can even do it. So that's something definitely to keep in mind. If it's ambiguous, make sure you're delivering as whoever it was put that comment in. Context is everything. And then the third thing is organize the material so that it makes sense. It'll flow in, we can converse. Look, I've been talking for almost an hour and nobody I think is having trouble. You might be bored, but hopefully you're not having trouble in, in uh, understanding what I'm saying, even though there is a vast amount of information coming at you because it comes in a way that's understandable. Simple, so I wanna now turn to how do you go around writing sentences? Okay, simple is better. So here are some rules for writing sentences. Keep the number of words per sentence low. Do not write long sentences on the web. Generally keep to one main idea per sentence. Now that doesn't mean you can't use conjunctions like and or but but it means don't shift the idea. So um, I can say the COVID-19 virus is very dangerous. Therefore, it's important that you stay at home. So there, that's a compound sentence with two, two elements connected by a conjunction, therefore. But it has one idea that cuts through the entire sentence. This next one is hard sometimes, particularly when you have a stakeholder who's just, oh, these are particularly academics, they just love these words. You gotta take them out, you've gotta be ruthless. Uh, Steve Krug says, edit, remove half the words, then go back and remove another half. And that really works. Another thing is avoid the passive voice. Uh, we use passive voice all the time in scholarly writing. Uh, it doesn't work with most people. Uh, so, you know, subject, verb, object, and always use the active voice. And if you've got other suggestions, please feel free to share them. So, here are some sentences that I wrote. And this is maybe a pretty typical, but I don't think terribly well written. Um, paragraph, because of the consequential programs, pro problems associated with the coronavirus, the experience of being a student at Princeton has undergone change. Fundamentally, in light of the considerable risks associated with the coronavirus, it has been deemed essential to shift to a remote learning paradigm. While the total and potentially complex educational consequences of this instructional shift are not yet well understood, it appears that the basic quality of instruction remains consistently favorable. This is a good example of probably how not to write for the web. So I'd like to give you an opportunity here to, uh, and again, we don't have an easy way to do this other than I think in your chat, but try to rewrite one or two of these sentences using some of the rules I mentioned earlier.
And then, you know, Gina, you could share some of them and then I'll share some of the rewrites I did on this. Sure, if I can also read one other question that uh, yeah. came in. Um, is there a particular grade level or range that you recommend most content should be? Fifth. Um, what I've generally heard uh, is that if you really want people to understand things, you should make sure that they, they, uh, they work on a fifth grade reading level. Uh, that's probably insulting if you mention that to a professor, so you might not want to say that. But one of the things that I have found is that, um, you know, things that are readable on a fifth or sixth grade reading level, people generally enjoy it because it's not a lot of effort. And uh, there are, again, on the web, readability scores. Actually, Word will do it for you. So if you're working in Microsoft Word, there's a, a place where you can say, give me the readability score. And there are a bunch, I forget the names of all of them, but there are three or four um, different readability scores that give you the grade level of your reading. So definitely worthwhile. Okay, let me give you a moment to write, and I'd love to hear what you come up with. I will say that in trying to write this, I really tried to walk the line. I don't think anybody, I mean, you can write these things so flowery and so awful that people would go, ah, oh, no, nobody would read this. But I think that this text, maybe with the exception of the last sentence where I got a little bit out of line there, but basically most people would think this is okay. Now, people would not look at this and say, this is, this is really poorly written, and yet it is. Uh, Charlie, we do have a comment that came in regarding the first sentence. Can I go ahead and read that out? Sure, please. Thank uh, you. Yep, first sentence. The student experience at Princeton has changed since the coronavirus situation. Yes, much better. And we have another one that reads, coronavirus risks obliged the university to shift to remote learning for students. The consequences of this significant change remain to be understood. Okay. Anyone else want to share? I'll show you mine. I, I um, I'm not, I, <laughs> not to sound defensive about it, but I am not going to suggest the way I've rewritten it is fabulous. But let me show you what I came up with. So the first one, because of the consequences, I changed that to the student experiences Princeton has changed because of the coronavirus. Very direct sentence. Um, the second one, because of the risks we've shifted to remote learning. The third one I have a lot of trouble with. While we don't know all the consequences, the quality of instruction appears good. I wanted to say, appears to remain good, but I really wanted to get rid of those three words. So I'm hoping that the word appears conveys, you know, I said it appears that overall the basic quality of instruction remains consistently favorable. So the way I would address, I, I would approach a sentence like this is I go through this and say, what words can I pull out of here? Do we care total and potentially or certainly not needed? Uh, complex, you know, some value, um, the basic quality of instruction, why is it basic? So we just pull those out, I keep simplifying and simplifying until I come up with something. Anyway, if you go through this process, you will uh, find that your, your, your writing is much more comprehensible on the web. Yeah, I saw a flash. Yeah, there are two more that just came in. Uh, the coronavirus has had a direct impact on the Princeton experience. As a result, the university has shifted to remote learning. Even with the unknowns associated with the shift, the quality of the Princeton educational experience remains high. 
Oh, I like that last one a lot. And then there's one more, um, a comment that says, I would advocate for keeping remains in that last sentence since it seems to be the heart of the information you want to convey. I think you are probably right. I, um, so it really, should, I would have to have written appears to remain good or something like that. Yeah, I think it was really tired, <laughs> but uh, I, I have to admit I was uncomfortable with that. Wonderful. Okay, coming to the last uh, topic that I'm going to cover today, and that is achieving connection. So just to review, let me go back. Remember, we had three steps. The first step was to understand your user. The second step was basically to understand your material. And then, then the third step is producing the material and three elements of that the visual clarity, the cognitive comprehension, and now we're going to get to the emotional connection. There's a lot we could say about connection, but I'm just going to talk briefly about two areas. One is tone and one is trust. So, and they're very closely related. Um, and a lot of this material that I've gotten out of this came from some studies done by the Nielsen Norman group. They're available on the web. Um, and um, that one of the comments they made was that 50%, 51% of the um, feeling, the positive feelings um, uh, that people had towards organizations based on the tone of the site came from their assessment of trustworthiness. And that trustworthiness was affected by the tone. I see there are, I can't read them, but uh, I get an orange flash. Yes, I can read them out to you. Which um, is great. Regarding tone and trust, could you please source the research that you had mentioned? Yes, it was an article by the Nielsen Norman Group. And if you just Google Nielsen or, or NNG, uh, tone, you'll find the articles. And if for some reason you can't find them, I'll be happy to send them to you. But um, there are about three of them that they've done. It's sort of, you know, one of the comments they make, they say tone is not like a primary kind of thing, but it really does seem to affect. Um, now what you will find with the Nielsen Norman group, uh, Jacob Nielsen is a very good researcher. Um, he was a UX researcher who came from um, uh, Sun Microsystems, and he teamed up with uh, Don Norman, who's a very famous psychologist who worked for, uh, I believe, Xerox Park and Apple. Um, so they're really high-powered people. Uh, so their research tends to be quite decent. Um, and I, I recommend uh, just looking at all the stuff. They've got probably 70 or 80 articles out there, which are really, really excellent. Uh, here are some of the things that I got from them. Uh, I'm sorry, did, was there a comment first? Uh, we had one of um, the participants send out one of the articles, so thank you for that, oh, Emily. Oh, wonderful. Um, so, tone conveys your attitude towards your reader. Tone creates a mood in your reader. So we're back to that model of transmission and reception, right? The, the transmission is your tone and the mood is what comes. And the comment that came out of that article was that tone strongly affects the reader's sense of trust, which is absolutely essential in your site. Um, Nielsen Norman came out with four dimensions for tone. Now they did this, as far as I can recall, uh, pretty much analytically. So, uh, they did not, um, uh, they didn't do factor analysis or anything like that. They did just a lot of Googling and came up with words and then figured out that these work. And they, they seem to be pretty good to me. So these are dimensions and you can be anywhere on these dimensions and you can use these dimensions independently. So you can be from, go from funny to serious, casual to formal, irreverent to respectful and enthusiastic to matter. Uh, a fact. But so you can be funny, formal, irreverent, and matter-of-fact, potentially. 
um, or any any combination of these. And you can and you can drop anywhere on these. Now, because we're Princeton, we're often serious, formal, respectful, and matter of fact. Uh, but interestingly, when you lighten up a little bit and you're a little bit more conversation and you're a little bit more informal, readers are much happier with it. They really uh, respond better and they come back with a better sense of who you are. So here are some examples. I, you can see what I was doing last night. Um, so here's, this is the same statement, right? But with different tonality. Load the dishwasher, that's the simple imperative. So my wife says, load the dishwasher. Um, would you please load the dishwasher? Okay, a little less formal, a little more courteous. This is also interesting. This doesn't work well in, um, in writing, but in speech, you can completely change the tonality of that by the word. So I could say, would you please load the dishwasher? Meaning, I'm not going to do it. Or would you please load the dishwasher because I'm really frustrated with you? Or would you please load the dishwasher instead of doing what you're doing with it right now? Or would you please load the dishwasher instead of putting them in the sink? So the words can change depending on the emphasis. Um, Okay, here's another one. Informal, toss the plates in the dishwasher. Of course, I, nobody expects me to really toss them in, but you could see how one might say that in the middle, in, in the right environment. Here's a very formal one. Sanitize the soiled crockery in the dishwasher. If we were dealing with, I mean, you wouldn't li be likely to say that at home, but you might, if you're writing a uh, compliance article for a restaurant, Say so it is absolutely essential that as dishes are returned from uh, use, you sanitize the soiled crockery in the dishwasher. And that would be totally appropriate tone in that environment. Okay, let's load the dishwasher and get the plate sparkling clean. I was going for enthusiasm there. And uh, sarcasm, uh, which is another tone. I don't suppose you would load the dishwasher, which means I really want you to do it, but I'm not going to say that directly. Any thoughts about tone? So here are some hints for using tone. Um, friendly and conversational tone is well received by people. That doesn't mean that you're bringing down the, um, the institution or the research or the product you can be friendly and conversational and still be very deep and, and, and meaningful. Professional doesn't mean that you necessarily are being cold or overly formal. Um, consider the emotional state of your reader. You know, be careful. Think about what your reader, and here's, I mean, here we are all worried about the COVID virus. The way you say certain things, um, there's, a, there's a whole thing right now in, in, in the news about, I guess, uh, President Trump suggested you might want to inject, um, inject um, disinfectants into people. And um, Procter & Gamble, who makes Lysol, is out there saying, do not inject Lysol into yourself. Don't drink it. Um, you have to really think about how people are going to receive it. Humor is something I tend to avoid. Humor can often backfire on you. And, uh, you know, what's funny to me may be insulting to you. And how often do you find somebody apologizing on television because they thought they said something humorous and they got themselves into a lot of trouble? So my suggestion is, uh, you know, most of the time, you know, unless you're the Harvard lampoon, be careful about uh, humor. And tone, as I've mentioned this several times, it's subtle, but it strongly affects the perception of trust. Jean, I saw there was somebody had a comment or question. Oh, it was just someone um, signing off, but sending a thank you for an informative oh, presentation. You're welcome. <laughs> um, this is actually my final slide, so they're not missing much. Um, this slide is around the dimensions of trust. And um, 
Trust to me is a fascinating construct. Uh, and there are many dimensions to it. I've actually seen some, some, some researchers who have come up with seven different dimensions, but I really like this one. Um, it's around integrity, competence, reliability, and concern. So as you're building your writing for the web, um, what you want to convey is your integrity, that you're being honest, that you are competent, you understand what you're talking about, you're not making stuff up, that you're reliable, meaning that when you say something, you will do it, you can, you know, and reliability also on websites to me has to do with uh, that it stays up and that I, you know, if I buy something on Amazon, it's actually going to ship. Uh, if Amazon tells me it's going to be here on Friday, it really will be there on Friday. And concern, which is really, do I trust you to have my best interests at heart? And I, I mean this particularly for those of you who are entrepreneurs and starting companies. Consumers are very suspicious. We know full well that organizations have a tendency to focus on their well-being, and we want them to focus on our well-being. So, you know, certainly uh, when I'm meeting with my financial advisor, I want to make sure that he is focused on my well-being and not on getting the most commissions for, um, for stock trades or you know, getting the right stuff from his organization because he has the right amount of money under management. So that's all I really have to say. I really want to just open this up to any comments, questions. I think we have five minutes left. Uh, there was a so, question that was just posed in the chat. Uh, what would you suggest to write up an interview? Um, this person writes profiles on people and, I, and they wonder how you would suggest approaching and organizing the material. Which I'd like to think about that a bit, not that I have any time to do it. Um, one of the things I have often found very, um, very uh, frustrating about interviews is that when I do an interview uh, on the phone, all of the stupid things I say end up in print. And I really would much prefer it if people would edit, to edit what I'm saying or give me the opportunity to edit. Because often in an interview, and, and there's some reason that journalists often feel it's essential to say exactly what I said, but really it's an article and it's a story. And I think we should treat interviews the way we treat uh, anything else that we're writing. Uh, I don't know how helpful that is, but, um, you know, and I think you really want to, when you're presenting the interview, you want to warm people, want to warm up your audience, present the credentials, make it, you know, create some sort of, of, of warm and fuzzy, if you can, for the person, or maybe this is somebody you're not happy with, but, you know, create the tonality of the interview before you went into it. Um, the extent to which you can change the sequencing, you know, I think really depends on, um, on your, the rules that you're working with. And, you know, ideally it would be nice if you could just have the conversation and then reorient it and rewrite it up in a way that makes it very easy to understand. Uh, but often you, you, that, that doesn't, you're not allowed to, or, where you feel that's not appropriate ethics, and I do understand that. Um, we also had someone submitting a thank, a couple thank yous, um, and Laura is looking for any, any any book recommendations on UX design. Book recommendations. Well, the first one I would recommend is get Steve Krug's book um, on uh, you know called "Don't Make Me Think." It, it's really a good book, and it's very easy. Um, it's, um, and if you're not, if you're relatively new to UX design, uh, there is a free book available right now on uh, Amazon, um, which is the uh, Interaction Design Foundation. It's a little bit salesy, but it's pretty decent. Also, there's a great book, which I like very much. And this is, again, I'm into the, um, the, the, uh, I'm not giving you very technical books, of which there are uh, many, 
Uh, if, you're, if you're a researcher, you might want Ben Schneiderman's book or Jenny Priest's book. Um, but uh, it, um, there's, um, sorry, I just went right out of my head which one I was going to. Oh yeah, John Kolko, J-O-N-K-O-L-K-O. He's written some really nice stuff about UX and also he's got some articles in the Harvard Business Review, uh, which you can read and you can get those free on the web. So uh, I think you can get one or two without subscribing or if you're um, associated with the university, you can get them through the library. So uh, I, I would say, but John's book is really a good one. Um, Bill Buxton has written some nice stuff on, uh, but it, it tends to be a little bit uh, more specialized. Bill was here last year, I think. Um, and he, he came to the Keller Center and gave, uh, gave a talk, which was wonderful. He's really an amazing guy. Are we done? Those are all the questions that came in. We did have one other question. Um, the spelling for Jacob Nielsen, but Greg um, provided that in the chat and Greg also sent the landing page um, for the NNG articles as well. That's great. I always have that problem too. That's why I always use NNG to find the articles. Um, my email address is up here. Please feel free to contact me after the last a webinar, several people wrote to me and asked for material and I was happy to, to share it. The uh, user experience office is, is part of the university. We exist to support you, to help you, uh, to make user experience easy. We don't charge for any of the work that we do. So please feel free uh, to contact me at any time and I or, or my colleagues would be really happy to help. Um, I see another flash. Yep, a couple of thank yous coming in. Um, and one more, sorry, what was the free book on Amazon called again? It's the, um, interac it's the Interaction Design Foundation. I think you can also get it from free from them, but if you go to Kindle, at least last week it was free. And if you can't get it, I snared a copy so I can uh, probably send it to you. Um, and it's like, it's really short. It's like an 80 page summary. We also have a thank you from Oregon coming in as well. Oh, wonderful. Well, listen, thank you all for putting up with me, for taking all this time. I know these things can be really hard to watch. Um, sometimes they're hard to give, but I hope it was useful. And uh, I really look forward to hearing from you all. Mm -hmm.